Well, thanks for uh, the opportunity to present here. Um, uh, like it was said that I will be talking about some of the, most of this will be published work, uh, but um, figured it would be a good setting to talk about some of the, uh, the cell-free messenger RNA fragments uh, and the analysis of these, these novel fragments in circulation. Uh, the, uh, I've, before I get started, I do want to make a little uh, plug for a special topics uh, um, article um, that we that I'm uh, guest editing for Frontiers of Genetics. Uh, it's on cell free RNAs and liquid biopsy and human diseases. There's all sorts of different types of uh, publications that we're accepting. And if you're interested and you have something that you might want to contribute to this special topics issue, just feel free to email me and uh, would have be glad to uh, get some um, some uh, submissions from from this group. And as I mentioned, the, the most of the work um, I'll be talking about today came, came from this uh, Embo paper that we uh, published a couple of years ago. And actually, uh, Class Max, who's talking after me, uh, they have very similar findings that they published around the same time. Uh, so the question that we had starting was, you know, obviously um, microRNAs have sort of been the the uh, the main uh, type of RNA that's been focused on in, in uh, these liquid biopsy applications, but but messenger RNAs and long non-coding RNAs are obviously a, a sort of the holy grail of this of this field in finding them. So, but why has it been so difficult to uh, to characterize them? There's been sort of conflicting evidence on on whether they're there or not. And our thought might be that uh, it could be that they're present in a fragmented form. Um, so once RNA gets out into plasma, there are ribonucleases that would theoretically digest any RNA that's not protected. Uh, and could um, also sort of along those same lines I'll talk about in a minute, but could the end chemistries of these, these resulting fragments actually prevent ligation um, of adapters that we use in these small RNA-seq protocols? Uh, and as you can see over here, our, our traditional small RNA-seq methods that are used require that there is a five prime phosphate and a three prime hydroxyl group, which microRNAs have, and which is why they, uh, this, this technology was developed largely for, and been used largely for characterizing the microRNAs. They work perfectly fine. But if it's lacking, uh, if any RNA is lacking a five prime phosphate or it has a, a three prime phosphate on it, uh, these, these ligation methods won't uh, work very efficiently. And actually, if you look at the RNAs that are present uh, in, in, the, um, in plasma, so RNAs A family members are some of the most predominant ones, they do actually leave fragments that have a, uh, a three prime phosphate and don't have a five prime phosphate. And so they are not you know, theoretically not amen amenable to uh, the ligation methods. And as I mentioned though, that microRNAs uh, processed through uh, RNAs three family members are perfectly well suited for these, these methods. So uh, as a, we called this phosphorNA-seq, but it's really a fairly simple idea here is that we add in a polynucleotide kinase step um, just upstream of our normal small RNA-seq uh, methodology. And PNK does, uh, has a five prime phosphatase uh, or uh, five prime kinase that adds a, uh, a phosphate group on the five prime end. And it does have a three prime phosphatase activity that will bump off any uh, phosphate that's on the three prime end. So in theory, any of these, uh, these different end modifications that are traditionally not uh, able to be uh, captured by small RNA-seq methods, we should now be able to capture them. Um, and just as a proof of concept, just to show you that this is, you know, that we're working, uh, uh, that this method is working, we use a synthetic RNA pool that we developed as, as part of the uh, ERCC group. Um, they're just synthetic RNAs, some of which are, most of which are microRNAs that have a five prime phosphate, three prime hydroxyl group, and then a subset of those that are, um, that, that would not be captured by our normal methods. And this is just showing that, you know, that these uh, regular microRNA-like fragments, we capture them equally well, uh, pretty much with and without PNK. Uh, but then when uh, either a five prime phosphate is missing or there's a, a three prime phosphate, um, they are not very well cap uh, captured by the, uh, the, the regular method without PNK treatment. But now once we treat with PNK, we can uh, see these fragments. And so now we wanted to apply the same uh, methodology to uh, plasma to, to cell-free RNAs and see uh, what the population of RNAs looks like. And we did this with just, uh, at least initially, with just uh, five uh, healthy uh, individuals, plasma from um, five healthy in individuals. 
And one thing that I do want to point out, uh, and I think is is fairly relevant for this this conversation, like how do we analyze uh, the the messenger RNA fragments, is this um, these false positive alignments. So when uh, if you go and you do the uh, alignments to the genome, uh, even putting it through excerpt or other uh, other pipelines that might be um, looking at you know quantifying messenger RNAs and other things, you can get alignments to. Uh, so in this case, you see this WDR74, and then uh, these uh, peaks over here are where our reads aligned. When you look at the alignments, uh, so you might actually see that WDR74 is highly, fairly highly uh, expressed based on your um, based on quantification from the standard pipelines. But when you go and actually look at the alignments, in this case, you can see that the pretty much all of the reads that aligned to WDR74 were actually uh, aligning to these the U2 uh, small nuclear RNAs in the uh, five prime UTR of this gene. And so really what we can say is that, well, these are probably not coming from this message, uh, this protein coding message, it's probably actually coming from a U2 small RNA. Uh, and so uh, these are, these actually, when we, we first started looking at the messenger RNA, uh, looking at these messenger RNA fragments and analyzing the P and K samples, uh, most of the highly abundant messenger RNAs that we were finding um, were false positive alignments. Um, I put excerpt in here, not to say anything bad about excerpt, but to say that something is as stringent and uh, carefully planned out as excerpt that's maybe not necessarily designed for looking at messenger RNAs, um, it can lead to false positive alignments. And I, I did miss, I will say that I missed Rob's talk at the beginning and things may have changed. And this is a excerpt pipeline. When I did this was probably three years ago. So it's probably gone through several iterations since then. But if I look at the top 50 express genes that came out from the excerpt pipeline, um, so this is the, the CPM of those messages that, that came out in those in the results, and but then go and look at the actual reads. So the percentage of those reads that aligned to repetitive elements or uh, endogenous small RNAs, you can see that many of the top 50 express genes uh, had 100% of the alignments contained within repeats. All this is saying is that there has to be extra care, not only to figure out as you know, the other talks we're talking about, like what genome it's coming from, but also uh, endogenous uh, annotations and making sure that the alignments are uh, or not to repetitive elements um, to, to actually look at what's actually a bona fide messenger RNA transcript. Uh, to take care of this, uh, I'd, I used a, uh, I, I developed a little a method that has many of the similar um, ideas is that you, you process the reads as normal, you align to uh, univet contaminants, other uh, viral RNAs, bacterial RNAs, you align to all of those, uh, and then anything that doesn't align goes on to the genome alignment. Um, I've actually uh, improved this pipeline somewhat uh, since then to actually do all of this alignment in one step. Um, but at least at, at, uh, for this paper, this is what we did. So basically saying, okay, what could be a contaminant? Anything that, that doesn't uh, align to that, then we can align to the genome and then go through a second round of filtering to just say, do any of these uh, alignments correspond to endogenous annotations of ribosomal RNAs, yRNAs, et cetera, uh, and then uh, filter those out and then do the uh, alignment and quantification. Uh, this is basically just showing that once we, uh, once we do the filtering, we don't throw everything out. So one possibility could be that there are really no messenger RNA fragments in there. But this is showing that once we do filter the reads, there are uh, still messenger RNA um, uh, fragments in there when we do the PNK. Uh, treatment. And uh, it was nice to see. So, for example, S100A8, uh, we see um, some alignments that correspond to exonic regions. It's in the correct orientation. And the nice thing is that they're actually repeatable, they're reproducible. We see the same fragments in these defined regions across multiple individuals. Um, and the, the last thing I'll talk about uh, is now can we actually see um, some changes, some expression changes uh, that might be biologically relevant. And uh, this, uh, we used a, a bone marrow transplant group that we collected longitudinally, um, weekly, starting a week before uh, the day of transplant and then weekly after that, and just did the same, put the, um, the RNA seq results uh, in through this, this pipeline. And uh, what we found were uh, that 
genes that showed correlated co-expression were enriched for specific types of tissue. So I saw one of the talks earlier kind of deconvoluting which, uh, which tissues that they come from. Well, what's interesting is that genes, uh, fragments of genes that are uh, enriched for, uh, that are highly enriched in particular tissues show correlated patterns of expression. And so I uh, have, I took the RNA uh, expression results, normalized them and, and so that they were on a, on a Z-score uh, and then did clustering of those results so that they were broken into uh, uh, clusters of co uh, significantly co-expressed co genes. And uh, so this is the coloring of the, the, the co-expressed gene patterns. And these were enriched in, uh, in, in one of the most uh, in significant ones were that these were enriched for liver enriched uh, genes. And what you can see is, so this is one of the individuals, PO4, PO7 is another one of the two individuals. They had distinct patterns of expression. So they both had some liver signature there. Um, but what was interesting is that, as you can see, over time, these uh, clusters sort of uh, uh, mirrored what these AST and ALT levels, which is just a marker of, of liver damage. Uh, and so um, this is probably most clear in PO7 here, where you can see the expression pattern of the PO7, this blue cluster up here. And then in blue and red are the AST and ALT values. And it correlates with it, although it lags behind by about a week. And what we think right now is happening is that uh, cells that are going undergoing uh, the liver cells will re regenerate after it has liver damage and regenerating cells can actually release more cell-free RNAs and exosomes and those things. And so we're thinking that this is more of a response. Uh, these genes are more in response to the the healing and the regeneration of the hepatocytes after the damage is actually happened. But the, the, the purpose of this was more to show that, that the, the, the RNAs, the messenger RNA fragments that we see do correlate with some known ongoing physiology and that you might actually be able to look at these correlated co-expression patterns and get a sense of which tissue they might be coming from, which organ and tissue. Uh, and uh, I think that's pretty much it since I'm probably running uh, short on time. Um, and I'd be happy to take any uh, questions. Thanks, Ryan. We do have one question um, asking, so should we revisit the sequencing of biofluids using the phosphorNA-seq method? I would say yes. Uh, so once you do the, the PNK treatment, microRNAs basically go off. Uh, we don't see many microRNAs on there. So I think microRNAs are really only captured base or, or largely they're just because they are the best for being captured. So I think there's a whole other subpopulation of RNAs in the biofluids that we're missing without uh, the PNK treatment or other methods that have come along now that don't rely on, on ligation-based methods. So bacteria, if you're interested in bacterial ribosomal RNAs, they show up with PNK treatment. Um, some other tRNA type fragments do uh, messenger RNA fragments. So there's this whole other population that um, I think there's a lot more useful information that's that's available in, in revisiting PNK and other samples that have been uh, done would be, I, I think, a great idea. Um, just to sort of comment or maybe get your response a bit, I. I think this whole issue of extracellular RNAs that have modifications that are therefore, um, we're basically blind to them with regular RNA-seq methods, I think is an important issue. Um, and you sort of need to develop a new method for each kind of modification you want to be able to read, unless you maybe use um, some sort of nanopore signal or something. Right. But, uh, I wonder if you have a comment on that before you get to one of the questions. Yeah, and there actually, I think there was a paper just came out, I don't even remember, it was fairly high profile that was sort of talking about doing, removing all sorts of different end modifications. I believe Andy Fires group did this years ago in C. elegans for, for capturing uh, uh, some of these, you know, those methylated ends and those things. So basically, yeah, you, you it, it is an issue. We don't know what's out there in, uh, in, in plasma, but yeah, removing these type of end modifications for doing ligation-based um, strategies is important. But then, yeah, if there's other methods that have been developed or nanopore type methods that could avoid this uh, this issue, um, it's something that we need to uh, need to address. I think. Um, someone online asks, how does the phospho RNA seq method compare to 
long RNA seq? Uh, the phospho RNA seq. So I think it's it's similar, but it, it, we're so how do I say? So it's basically just using true seq. So basically any small RNA seq method that you're you're using you can just apply this, this PNK treatment on it. I don't think there's any PNK uh, treatment in the long RNA-seq, if I'm, I'm remembering correctly. There's also no capture of, of you know, poly A tails that are there, or we don't do any ribosomal RNA removal at this point. But um, basically our thought with this is that it would just fit into the normal workflow that people are already doing for looking at small RNAs. These are similar fra fragment sizes in uh, as small RNAs. And it basically, it just takes a method that people are already using and just add this PNK treatment in, in the beginning. Um, someone incorrectly put a question in the Zoom chat, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, what's the biological significance of mRNA fragments? Are they able to reprogram other cells, or are they just um, byproducts or biomarkers? It, it's a very good question. We don't know. Um, I, so the fragments themselves are, pro are too short to really encode anything that is, that's, you know, it can't encode protein. But what we've, we're thinking is that these RNAs are protected by um, RNA binding proteins. Probably most of them, I'm guessing, are, are ribosomal, you know, ribosomes, just because of how much ribosomal RNA is there. But it could be that the, the proteins that are bound to these RNAs might have, have a function. Um, it doesn't rule out any, you know, the possibility of these acting as some sort of an interfering RNA in some way, but, um, uh, we aren't, uh, we haven't looked at that yet, but it's, it's a very interesting question to look into. Um, now the question is sequencing without the PNK method still able to give reliable results for cell free mRNA or are they too heavily biased sort of a repeat of an earlier. Question. Yeah, it, it's very heavily biased towards uh, microRNAs. There's also, you do, you miss a lot of them. So there are, there, there are a subset of messenger RNAs that we do actually see with, with, um, without PNK treatment, but it's, uh, it's, it's all a distinct subset and uh, we're kind of working out right now what that might be. I think there's some mechanistic uh, things that are going on with that, but without the PNK treatment, you're missing um, a good fraction of those messenger RNAs. And, and so I think it's really needed to, to get, any sort of reasonable coverage. They're still very rare in the population and we're doing some you know, similar things to what um, some people were talking about here is sort of enriching for these messenger RNAs, capturing them uh, and doing the PNK treatment on captured RNAs um, because they are still small. But we, yeah, without doing the PNK treatment, you're missing, you're missing a lot. Um, I'll try to combine two questions here. So um, you mentioned that microRNA go away with this method. Can you explain why? And also, um, could it be that you do not see microRNAs after PNK treatment because you spend reads on ribosomal fragments? Definitely. I mean, that's that, that last point I think is, is exactly what's happening. Um, that once you do the PNK treatment, you are pulling in a lot of ribosomal RNAs and, and other things. And that sort of, they're probably the more dominant, uh, you know, in terms of just, you know, the bulk quantity of RNAs that are out there. It's just that, that we're probably not sequencing deep enough then to, to capture the, the microRNAs. So they're definitely, I mean, they're still there, but yeah, we do lose a lot um, because of just being saturated by these, uh, the, the, the ribosomal RNAs. So, you know, I think, you know, that was one of our questions. One of the things that we're actually working on right now is how do we actually get rid of some of these unwanted uh, RNAs, the ribosomal RNAs that we're getting at the same time. And maybe if we can do that, um, we can, we'll get to see the, the microRNAs again, and then it would be sort of a one-stop shop. You wouldn't have to actually do, you know, PNK plus minus PNK to get your microRNAs and then your messenger RNAs. Um, 